So hello everyone, I will tell you today about the learnings of my team on a very intense project uh, that I did a few months ago. So I work at uh, Theodo, we're an agile mobile and web development agency based in London. Um, so we build MVPs or help companies undergo their digital transformation. So it's either very big companies or small startups. Um, uh, and we, we really uh, train our clients to agile. So the goal of this project, to give you a bit of context, um, so it was in a bank, secret bank in a country far, far away. Um, and uh, so it was the first React Native app that the bank was attempting to, to do. And um, so basically what the problem we're trying to solve is that uh, currently, the customer onboarding for a new customer on this bank is uh, doing 50 pages of paperwork and waiting 15 days. And so the goal of the project was to bring that to five minutes uh, and the customer doing it by themselves with an app. So to test that we were able to do that, to achieve it, um, we sort of invented a pretext, which is to do a prepaid cards app where we will test see if the bank's backend teams and, uh, and backend infrastructure and the bank's uh, basically uh, skills were able to achieve this customer onboarding on an app to then transfer it to their main core business, right? So what is a prepaid cards app? It's a Revolut-like. Basically, you, you have a customer onboarding at the beginning where you enter your details, you take a picture of your ID, a picture of yourself, and then when you get accepted three minutes later, you can log in. And when you log in, you get a digital card and a real card. Um, that you can freeze and freeze, use, top up, whatever. Basic, very like um, a small part of Revolut's uh, features. So the second goal of the project was to train the bank to agility. Um, so basically we were helping them uh, get in the mindset of um, how to build a product and do an MVP. But MVP, in case someone, some people don't know, it's a minimum viable product. So it's Instead of trying to build a big machinery and release in two years a software that's obsolete and doesn't work, uh, build the smallest software that you can, release it to production and iterate over it. Um, so we were all in uh, the so-called agile war room, right? Because it was the first agile uh, uh, intent of this company. We were around 20 people in it. Uh, management, legal, cards, marketing, security, the devs, everyone together which was really nice to remove blockers, right? Because you can just walk to the next desk and uh, ask uh, when you have a problem, you can ask the right person. But also meant we had a lot of interruptions of people wanting to know what's going on. Hey, the devs, how is this feature going? Why are we so slow, etc., etc. So you can imagine. So it was quite hard to, to push back. To finish with the context, um, we were only the front-end team. We were three devs, we we're only the, the front-end team. So we had to deal with their in-house back-end team. Uh, what does this mean? So first of all, that we had to deal with a legacy system under the hood. You know, those bank, banks layers of backend systems that the deeper you go, the more legacy. And we had to modify it to fit our needs. So first challenge. Second challenge, on top of that legacy backend, there was a fresh web API that one of the devs, the backend in-house devs, just coded for us to call. Uh, so meaning that we had a bit of the inconvenience of both things, right? With the, the legacy code, it was hard to modify the code. But then the fact that we had a fresh web API on top um, made that we lost the benefit of the legacy code, which is that at least you know that it works normally. We, this API had never run before. So, so yeah, it was, it was pretty, pretty worrying. Um, the second thing that was a bit worrying and that made this project quite intense is that uh, the business kept repeating during the whole length of the thing. The app has to be up to bank standards of quality, which means let's not do agile, let's... Uh, Let's do waterfall, right? Um, so, okay, we want to learn Agile, but make sure you make a perfect app that has all the features. Crazy. Um, so that's the context. As you can see, it's a very intense situation. I don't think most of us are faced with that, but there are hopefully some learning still on how to make a, a project go smoother. So we had 10 weeks. We were two and a half devs because uh, one of them was half staff somewhere else. And we had an initial plan. So what was it? Let's say those are the 10 weeks, we're at the beginning, right? And let's say that this represents the capacity. So two and a half devs that, that have a capacity per week. And I'm going to put boxes in there to show more or less how long a feature is supposed to take and how much workforce it requires. <clears throat> so the first thing that they told us from the beginning is that we had to code a custom encryption layer 
for network calls in React Native. Um, so basically, on both sides, backend and frontend, we had to encrypt and decrypt, uh, hash, verify hashes, and sign our requests, uh, or generate keys. I mean, I learned, I learned it there, so I don't really know what it does, but I just did it. Um, so imagine, so in Node, it's already really hard, but imagine if you have to do that in React Native, where you don't have access to all the native uh, methods to do that. The libraries are quite uh, not very mature. So, so that was quite hard. And the problem is that since we had to do this before we could do any backend call, we had to start doing the UI before implementing the logic and the calls of that UI. That's really weird, right? You, you start making an app that's completely dummy, that has only hard-coded data in it, uh, anticipating that after more or less two weeks, you will finally be able to start coding the sagas, the, the calls, etc. Um, so then we had lots of um, classic features that just represented roughly what we had to do. Uh, thank you, React Native, for that, by the way. Um, one, one thing I would like to mention in particular is this one. So this was the core business hypothesis. Jumio is a service provider. It's the one that allows you to, um, it's a third party, allows you to match your ID with your face. So the goal of the whole project was to do a flow, including this one, but we decided to do it post MVP to replace it with a form at the beginning and to implement it just after the MVP. So just, I signal it for later. Uh, so this was our plan and we told the business people, amazing, uh, yeah, it should be all right, it's gonna be okay, with our little angel faces. And of course, in real life, this is not what happens. It wasn't okay at all. And this is what I came to tell you today, um, <coughs> to tell you about. So I, there should be learnings from every, for everyone, hopefully mainly on how to drive a project despite uh, time pressure and business pressure, um, and, and generally how to effectively, as a technical person, communicate what is going wrong, or your prioritization views, like, no, we shouldn't do this first, even though it looks shiny, we have to do the tough, the tough things first. So I'm, I'm gonna try to explain how we manage to communicate that uh, to the business. Um, so there will be a few technical things, but it's mainly about project uh, communication. So. The naive beginnings. What happened at the beginning? So we were quite optimistic. We run on the project. We start, um, and we were here. So what happened here? First week, the guys, the business, as a waterfall organization that they were, um, picked one thing of the idea of MVP that they really like is that you can ask people to deliver something at a given date. They really, really like that idea. So they said, "Okay, guys, MVP is going to be on, on week six, and you guys managed to fit it in there." Okay, so yeah, okay, let's move stuff around a little bit. Might not fit this part, but we'll see how it is with this feature, it might go. So we lost our little angel face, but we're still quite optimistic and said, okay, let's crack on, let's do this. Um, so once again, we, we still had the business, the core of the business fitting there, so it was, it, it was okay. Spoiler, we should have said no already at this stage, but yeah, we'll see. So one thing we got right at this point is that we got rid of the bottlenecks. What do I mean by that? <clears throat> so imagine a situation, I'm gonna do a schematic uh, situation, where you have a big chunk of shiny UI to do and a task that has a dependency. So what's a dependency? It's before you can do the backend work, the, the backend calls, you have to code this encryption layer. And this dependency, even worse, is a bottleneck, meaning that you only, you only can have so many developers working on it at the same time. For example, the encryption layer, we couldn't put three guys trying to figure it out. It's a one developer track where you have to progress. So if you detect that you have a piece of work like this, of course, um, if you start by doing the shiny stuff because you think business will be very happy to see how much you can produce and you will reassure yourself on your speed, then this is what's gonna happen after, right? You're gonna fail. It seems really obvious, but, but it isn't. It's hard to detect these situations. So yeah, you might not deliver anything, miss detecting future problems if you work on the easy stuff first, and run out of work because once you have done all the big obvious piece of work, then when you have a, 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 de a dependency like this, you might have developers that, that are idle. So what you need to do, of course, is to first work on the hard thing that's not really visible, and then fit the rest of the UI where you can, and you can succeed. So, Applying this principle, we started working on the encryption layer, as I was telling you before, and, uh, and this allowed us to, to figure out problems really early. So what happened? When we got here, so end of the coding of the encryption layer, right? 
Well, um, reality hit us. So it wasn't the case at all that it will last two weeks. Why? Because as I said, it's really hard to code that in JS. And I mean, we're just calling a backend. We don't know what happens there inside. It's extremely hard to debug. We, we, we didn't know if it was us or the backend that was wrong. Like we had no clue where we were. What we had though was two example apps uh, that the bank had built before on iOS and on Android with native code that implemented the security layer. So we decided, okay, let's stop everything and let's try to implement that uh, in native code. So we are JavaScript developers. None of us had ever touched any type of native code. And we had like two weeks maximum to figure out something unless, or, or we will fail completely the project. Fortunately, good news, if you ever have to do that, it's quite easy to figure out. First of all, bridging. I don't know, you probably have heard a lot about bridging already. So I'm not going to explain you how it works. I'm just going to explain you. It's extremely easy. You have this library, 600 stars, and in half an hour, you get a hello world uh, from your native code to your React Native debugger. Like, it's really easy, console log. So if you have to do just a little function for a punctual need, like encryption, a bunch of functions, it's really nice to do it with this. Java and Swift are actually quite OK. Um, so for a p person that codes JavaScript on a daily basis, you write your instructions. It's nice. What is not OK at all, though, is Objective-C. Really? I don't know. I think you guys seem to know what it is. Uh, like when I saw this thing where the end of the name of the function is the first argument, I mean, I, I just started crying anyway. So and the problem is that we had a piece of code on iOS that we really needed to translate into Swift. Fortunately, most of you know it probably, but the two languages are equivalent. So you can literally paste a piece of code of Objective-C, a function, in a tool, for example, called Swiftify on the internet, and it translates it in Swift. So having Objective-C is like having Swift, and it saved our day. Um, but so a takeaway from this is that we lost two weeks initially by trying to replicate in JavaScript something that's really complicated and that we had an example code for. So the lesson is that we should have not been afraid of native code and done it from the beginning. We would have saved a lot of time. Why a lot of time? Because the consequence of this going so big, remember, it's a dependency, is that then the backend works moves here, right? And that's quite problematic. Um, so at this stage, we got the second thing right. Still uh, in our naivety, we were quite worried, but we got a few things right. So the second thing we got right is that we secured what's critical. So yes, yeah, it says, if there is a risk to fail short, start by doing the business critical features that the app can't exist without. So remember the Jumia flow. When we saw that this thing was going to take so long, we, 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 we tried to plan the features, and we saw that the core hypothesis of the project might not only not make it in a VP, but not make it in the whole project at all. And that would have meant failure immediately, and that we would have lost our credibility, and we wouldn't have basically delivered the value and tested the hypothesis we wanted. So we moved it back, and we got here. So here, what happened? We got the third thing right, and that's the, the last thing right that uh, we got, I promise. So we focused on what's uncertain. So remember, we're here, meaning we're finally we have coded the encryption layer, and we're about to start working with the backend team. Um, so again, my little schematic. So let's say you're here at the beginning of a piece of work, right? Wiring everything to the backend, you finish your encryption layer, and you don't know, you're not sure how long it's going to take you. Same thing, you need to detect these situations. If you don't do anything about it, when you end up here, you fail, right? If you're in the bad case scenario. Then there's another case. If when you get here, it's actually this big, then actually you have no excuse to have missed the elephant in the room, and, and you fail, but even more. Like, you, you don't know what's going to happen. So what should you do when you detect a piece of work where you have a bit of uncertainty? Um, the same conclusion as before. You should immediately put all your capacity on that piece of work. All the developers on the big thing, the big chunk that you don't know if it's going to explode in your hands or not. And then, well, best case scenario, everything fits. Worst case scenario, at least you can warn the team, the business, way earlier for everyone to react together and adapt um, to, to, to the problems. So I consider this as a success as well, because I mean, reality is reality. Sometimes something is hard. You just have to make sure that you are aware of it as early as possible. So applying this principle, we were here. We put all the team on the big chunk, the big piece of work with the backend team, because we didn't know how this team worked. We didn't know 
Remember, we had this fresh API that was never tested and all this legacy code, it was really, really scary. And so what does it look like to allocate a full team on one, one big a certain task like this? It looks like this. So I don't know if you know about Scrum and Agile and Kanban stuff. But at some point, so Scrum is about sizing tasks, sizing tickets, and saying, OK, next week we're going to do this task, this task, this task, this task. And we know it's more or less going to take this time, so it should be fine. When you are on completely uncertain work, you have no clue where you're going. You cannot size tasks. So we just started figuring out ways of logging those tasks. Um, each, each one of these rows is a backend call, and we are basically logging the percentage of how much we thought of it was working. Um, and, and this is how we progressed the first week with the backend team. So a bit of context maybe, because I'm not sure I've been clear. The problem with that backend team is that <clears throat> they hadn't coded their side of the encryption layer, meaning that they could not call their own backend. What does this mean? That they had never executed their code once. Not they didn't write tests, of course, because they cannot even execute their code. So have you ever seen a piece of code that works without having executed it? It's completely crazy. So the guys were waiting for us to have the app, to click the button, to finally execute their code for the first time. And of course, it doesn't work. So this is why you have to log percentages. You're like, OK, 20% of this call works, but then on the third service there, it breaks. So the first two services go through, but the third one breaks. And we're logging this. So uh, putting all our capacity on it, in like three days, we managed to have tested a bit all of the calls. Uh, lots of them were on 95%, I don't know why. And so the consequence of this in the front end code is that you have like 25 sagas that are all stacked, that you have to refactor for an, a month and a half, that you have fights over after. I mean, I don't wish you this at all, ever. But anyway, so here uh, stuff starts to look really bad, right? And here is chapter two starts. Um, so. I think, yeah, the beginning of this part, I think, is the date where we started to leave the work on average at 9 p.m. because stuff just goes crazy. <laughs> so what happened? The first week of work with the backend team passed, and we encountered problems, of course. So first of all, here, uh, yeah, remember I told you that um, we started coding the UI and the backend separately. Now that the encryption layer took all the space, we had done almost all the UI hard-coded with no backend. Uh, what does this mean? That, of course, when you try to connect them, this happens. Um, concretely, the guys were answering us 200s for everything. So even when there was a bug, they were answering us 200. How do you handle that? Can you please answer me a 400 if there is an error? Oh, yeah, OK, I'll do that for you. What if we had realized that five weeks before? Lots of wasted work avoided for both teams. But we hadn't because of that security layer. Um, again, they didn't execute their code even once, as I explained to you. Um, so actually, we were dependent on the backend as any front end, but the backend was dependent on us to develop their features, remember, because they had to click. It's crazy. Um, and the, the last thing that, that made us lose a lot of time that we didn't detect with the backend team is that they had one development server. So I don't know if you have developed like this ever, but the guys don't develop in their local machines. They have a development server, meaning that if one of them puts a breakpoint, it's going to stop the other ones. <laughs> so we would often like, hey, can you test the call for me, please? OK, so I interrupt my task. OK, I will uh, mount the app on the simulator. I will click on the button for you. I will wire everything. OK, I clicked 30 seconds later. Are you sure you clicked? Uh, yeah, yeah, let me do it again. Still doesn't come through. Hey, guys, did someone put a breakpoint? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> It's me. Can you give me two minutes, please? OK. At least they could have a dashboard showing who is putting a breakpoint or something. So when you realize those problems six weeks after, you're like, guys. Anyway, uh, second thing. So obviously, um, we had a lot of design flaws in our front end that we did not detect because we did not wire the back end. So for example, one good friend of us that is present today gave us an amazing advice of using middlewares and not bothering using sagas. Do not try to do that. I don't advise you. So once you have the sagas, first of all, it's less boilerplate to write. And sagas have amazing thing, things like take, for example, that I don't know, it seems so simple, but in middleware, I couldn't even write a take. So we had to refactor all our middlewares into sagas, for example. Um, and yeah, basically, instead of doing feature by feature, you visit all the features in the front end first. And by worrying the back end after, you revisit them all. So there is a lot of context switching with that, right? Lots of time lost. <coughs> so that's why 
we pushed back a bit uh, the back end, and then another week passed. And what happened here? You will have guessed, of course. It got even worse, more problems. What are those problems? So we started putting stuff in prod, right? Remember this old principle that we all apply now? Uh, so we did, uh, that wasn't the case. Um, why? So the guys did not have test data. So first of all, sometimes they didn't have test DLLs or whatever, meaning that the test server could not run some features. So meaning that sometimes they were telling us, oh, sorry, we can't test this. We have to wait to be in production to see if it works. Okay, so which you can imagine that you lose a few weeks if you start uh, having to test features like that. The second thing is that uh, they could not control their test database. Like, you know, the test database, you create fake customers, you delete them, etc. Here, once we had used up a real person's ID, it was finished. You had to find another one to create. Uh, and this app is about the onboarding flow, so it's about creating accounts, the, the core of it. So once we had used up the 20 people in the room, we had to start calling friends. I mean, one of us, the UK guy, had to go create an ID of that country to, to, to make an account. And crazy situations. So, of course, you lose a lot of time with that. And finally, last problem that you encounter at this point was a few backend design flows. So, I won't enter into details, but uh, big, big problems like the guys were, so they were sending us flags. So, we were supposed to set flags in the backend stating at which stage the customer was in the flow, but those flags were wiped out if we, um, if we uninstalled the app, right? There, there, there was an ID to remember, remember them. So this means that they intended us to use the backend as a hard drive. So after a week, you realize, but guys, I'm just going to use the local storage. Why did you build this whole feature? So again, so, many, so much time lost by the guy who coded this in the first place on the backend team. We didn't challenge him on that. We didn't know he was doing that. Uh, second thing is, uh, yeah, they weren't sending us some logic that we needed. Well, lots of free work that we didn't detect because we worked separately in the beginning. So, <sighs> what happens here? So, we're a complete failure, right? Um, well, what happens here is that now business comes in, right? Because it's the week uh, seven, six, I don't remember exactly. Uh, you're three, four weeks uh, before the end of the project. You haven't really put in prod. They see all these problems, they hear about backend problems, but they don't see them, right? Because they, they don't really understand what it is. You try to explain them, sometimes they get interested, sometimes not. They have time, they don't have time. And so here they start reminding you about the real priority of the project, right? That is to actually train their in-house developers to React Native. Guys, don't forget, this is the priority. And you're, uh, we hadn't even started doing that. And, and they come and they tell you that. And then they, they started putting meetings all the time. Um, telling us, guys, can you please fix this bug that I found here? Sorry, I'm trying to make the top-up work, which is like the core thing of the app. Why are you asking me to change your input code uh, padding? I mean, come on, anyway. But the guys start to freak out, and they really, really, really ask you stuff. And also, um, we, yeah, the code couldn't get out of the bank, which means we couldn't use CI services, for example, and we had security audits taking time. I mean, yeah, crazy. Sorry. Tell me if I speak a bit too quickly, but this was really a crazy moment. Um, and so what had we done wrong? How, how did we get here? So my diagnosis is that we did not ask the hard questions at the beginning. We did a few things right, but we mainly did other things wrong. We didn't do the go and see. What is that? So the go and see is when the business guy told us that the app we need to implement that custom encryption layer and certificate pinning, instead of saying, yeah, yeah, let's do it, we should have asked, okay, uh, can I see right now the requirements of it, a code base that implements it? And we would have reacted immediately telling them, okay, guys, we have to get this encryption layer out of the way before bringing in all the developer teams so that when they start, the backend and frontend work hand in hand together and we don't, don't have all these problems. We also would have detected all these uh, backend design flows because we would have started working hand in hand from the beginning. Um, the second thing that we didn't do, the second go and see we didn't do is when they told us that we are working with a backend team that's not us, we should have asked them, okay, can I now code just a small feature with them, put it in staging, put it in prod, and see what happens. We would have detected that their code is untested, and therefore it doesn't work at all, that they bother each other when debugging, so okay, let's try to do something about it, and that they don't have test data at all. Um, and so actually this is real feedback that the, the client gave us on week eight. They said, why didn't you figure out the problems before by sitting down with our guys? So, so yeah, I think this is like the main learning from this experience is that 
we need to, to take time to figure out what are going to be the biggest pain points at the beginning of a project instead of trying to just rush through. So how did we survive in the end? Because we ended up being quite successful with this app. What, what, are, what, what did we do? Uh, so we asked for help to a lot of people. And what, what should we do now? Um, so as a team, I'd say with the business, we communicated a lot and we took, took strong decisions. Uh, and we did that early enough to, to not fail. So if you do this on week 9 of 10, you're going to fail. We did it around week 6 or 7, uh, which meant we were okay. So first, we challenged features. So um, yeah, when a guy tells you we need magic feeling that when the, the person um, enters their, their email, they receive the input code by SMS, and that input code is automatically transferred to the app so that they don't have to go in their SMS app to put you, you said, uh, come on. We are not even having the back-end work. Let's remove this feature. No way. Uh, same thing. When the guy tells you on my Galaxy S8, the top of the code input is cut, you say, OK, I don't care. We'll figure it in four weeks. So we started saying, really, uh, let's just focus on the priorities. Second thing is we sat down to spend time to solve problems. So remember, the guys didn't test their code, the back-end team. So we, one of our team members, actually, not, not me, me, I was trying to rush, but one of our team members said, OK, I'm going to sit down, pause for three days, code a Node.js tool that will be able to call the back end so that they are more independent. And actually, this was the best thing, the best decision taken in the project, because after, they weren't bothering us with calling their thing. They were more autonomous, and they could write tests. So it was amazing. We also trained the, the, the client to, to get us some test data. So we problem solved, and then finally, we communicated with the business to, one, make them bother us less because they had visual feedback on what was the stage of the project. So uh, doing Kanban or Scrum, depending on the situation, showing the board, as you saw before. Um, and so this allowed us to really react to problems as quickly as possible, decide on removing features as quickly as possible, features decisions. Um, and so, so the, the, the takeaway of this also is that we, we try to say the hard truth uh, as soon as possible from, from then on. And uh, this is a, a good ass covering technique because if you tell, it's like with your parents, right? If you tell something two weeks later, it's going to be way worse. So just say it when you know it. And so more concretely, what we did, we play with the three dimensions. So time, which is length of a project, scope, which is amount of features that you put inside, and um, capacity, which is the amount of developers. So first, the title was a lie. We extended by two weeks. Um, they were really reluctant, but we managed to get that. So then if it's a bit better, then we removed features that weren't absolutely necessary. It was hard to negotiate, but uh, with a lot of communication, the business ends up understanding that the goal is to have something in production first and then see what happens. Um, and, and we also reduced uh, the number of developers. We increased sorry, the number of developers. We gained two more developers for the end of the week, for the end of the project, and managed to, to get everything OK. So when we got here, we had also uh, a, a few good uh, surprises at the end of the project. Certificate pinning ended up being a lot smaller than we thought. I don't know if you know what it is, but it's a common security thing that you have to do in, in, in some apps. And it actually takes one day. If you ever hear, hear about it, certificate pinning, if you have to do it, uh, with the right blog article on Google that you find, it's actually one day. Um, then analytics. With App Center, it's actually really, really small to do. It's smaller than this. It took us like three hours to get a funnel, saying like, uh, you know, the funnel is the thing where the customer, you, you get to know uh, to what stage of the process the customer got. And so analytics, crash reports, et cetera, all integrated in App Center out of the box was amazing. Um, and so we ended up being able to integrate some feedbacks from the customers. Uh, fix bugs, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, which was unexpected. So what allowed us to do that was really to take the strong decisions just in time. So yeah, I call it success, but we haven't delivered everything. So why do I say that? First of all, because we have delivered an app, we have delivered value by having the app in production, and this is you can do whatever you want. If you don't end up with something in production, it's useless. We had delivered enough value in the sense that the core hypothesis, which is the bank wanting to test if they were able to do this customer journey with the ID and the picture, etc., was delivered. So the, that goal uh, has, been, uh, has been met. And now they're doing marketing campaigns all over the country with the app, etc. So it's really it's a thing. They're able to test their hypothesis. 
And finally, for the part where we didn't deliver everything, with good expectation management, we managed to have them happy, and they're actually talking, still talking to us, and we'll, I think, I hope, that we will work with them again. Um, so just to summarize how we got there, in my view, so what I've been talking about uh, for, for the last 25 minutes, you need to go, so in general, in hard projects, but in any project, if you want to avoid waste, you need to go hit reality as soon as possible. So work only on the hard stuff at the beginning, even if it's not visible, so that you investigate and discover the dependencies, the uncertainty, the tasks that you thought were, were easy, but actually were hard. The UX, the UI, there is no, no, almost never a problem with that, right? You, you know it's going to be OK. But work on the hard things first. Then, once you know something is hard, go communicating to the team immediately so that together you can decide maybe it's not worth doing. Was it, was it really worth uh, doing a push, um, touch ID in the MVP? I'm not sure. Uh, and, and even though the, the business insisted a lot at the beginning, I'm sure you can convince them if you show them the problems that it might not. The second thing, so I've not talked about this at all, but is to save a lot of time and remove all the friction in your project. So what can I mention from here? So the analytics and uh, uh, deploy to staging of App Center is amazing. Uh, so the, we couldn't use a CI server, so we use uh, Fastlane with Match for code signing and deploying everything in one command. So we had one command, hard deploy to staging plus production on iOS and Android. Code push, we did lots of things, nasty things with it, and, but like it saved us hours, I think. You, you just uh, deploy every feature in 30 seconds, even in prod. And now you can code sign, code push, so it's really, um, really, really secure. Um, and yeah, I really don't like Redux forms and the state of React Navigation right now, but when you know something, we didn't know anything else. When you know something and you have three months, just use that. And, and, and don't try new things, right? Uh, even though I really would like to move to Formic or something soon. Um, so I wanted, I just have one or two minutes to show you the, the trick that we did to get the funnel in like one or two hours. So you grab the piece of code that's on the React Navigation website that is called uh, Screen Tracking Middleware. You put it in there, you make it dispatch an action on every screen change, because you cannot rely on component did mount with React Navigation, right? Uh, it doesn't work because it keeps stuff mounted. So really, you need this trigger to know that the customer has changed page. Then you catch that in a saga, and you send an analytics track event event with a string inside. So here, navigation to the name of the screen. Um, so this is out of the box with App Center. There's a method. You don't have to integrate anything. It's not like Firebase or whatever. You just yarn install. Yarn App Center and then React Native Link, and you're good to go. You have this. And from then on, immediately, your event will appear in App Center. Here you see navigation to landing, navigation to sign up, home, login, account, whatever, with all the stuff like the guy has initiated a session, uh, unique customers, etc., handled for you under the hood. And then you go in App Insights, which is a Microsoft service. I'm a bit VRP of Microsoft, but they're becoming quite good. It's free. You can wire it to App Center in one click. So if I go to the next slide, you see at the top right, View Application Insights. You click on the tab um, Funnels here, and then you have all your events, and you select them. So Event 1, Navigation to Home. Event 2, Navigation to Landing. Event 3, Navigation to whatever. Boop, 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 and you have your funnel telling you the customer conversion, etc. So as a first setup, the thing takes, I mean, when I do it, it takes 15 minutes to set up. It's a really good trick. So, and these are the analytics that you get out of the box with App Center. You don't have to do anything to get this. So it's quite nice. <clears throat> the third thing that we did was to do pragmatic code choices, and I will finish on this. Um, to, so, to, in order to succeed. Um, so, first, spend time on project setup. Yeah, at the beginning, you want to go fast, but no, you better spend uh, two days more making everything super nice. The, I don't know, the linter, the deployment, the prettier, the whatever, all the dev environment the deployment commands, I don't know, project setup, so that then the team doesn't lose time every day with little things. <sighs> Second thing, a bit controversial maybe, but I'm really convinced by this. Uh, for front-ends, in particular mobile, that are not too crazy, I'd say just have a good flow type or a good TypeScript. 
but a really good one that you can rely on because most problem, uh, front end problems are that stuff is not wired correctly, right? With this, you get it. And maybe end to end test, actually. I think flow type and end to end test is a very good combo, but Jest is, is uh, how do you say this? It's a time eater. I mean, Jest, you spend more time trying to fix Jest itself than the code. It's crazy. The, 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 right now, I'm on a project with Jest. I hate it. Um, and why do I say this? Uh, I forgot. But anyway, we say, oh, yes, because, because, for example, typically, when we wrote the 20 sagas and we spend a month and a half refactoring them, so to remember the sagas are the things that do the backend calls. If we had saga tests in parallel, and when you have to do all these refactorings, you also have to refactor and maintain the tests that are actually testing nothing because nothing is in production. You double, triple the time you lose with, with things. Whereas flow type, on the contrary, tells you when you're refactoring if you broke something and makes you find it a lot easier. So really, I will start projects only with flow and take the decision of running just test once it gets big and successful, not before because I think it's useless. Um, don't be afraid of native code. Uh, we will have safe time with this if we had done it before. And don't try new things. Yeah, I mean, so the middleware thing or maybe even though I didn't like Redux form, we, we chose to, to use it and it was good enough for, for what we were doing. Um, and finally, Lottie, who talked about Lottie? Lottie is amazing. Lottie and InVision actually. So unload as much stuff as you can to the designer so that you can just copy, you know, you put your, uh, what's the name, the simulator, you put it physical, uh, pixel accurate, you put it just next to InVision and you do everything like that. Um, and you use Lottie for uh, them just to give you a JSON and you integrate it there uh, without having to do anything. And this last slide, which is a little bit weird, um, one thing we did a lot was to call people at our uh, core um, company in Paris or London every time we hit a blocker because in this type of project, but even in general, you don't really care about figuring out why something uninteresting is not working. You just want to deliver the business value. You want to deliver your project. So it's not really interesting to tunnel on a task. Yeah, and for that, never forget to, to, to call for help. This is like the, the big message that I got at my company and I would like to, to tell it in general to you. As a coder, never forget to call for help. That's it. <laughs>